This is it, boys and girls. This is what we've been training for. Hey guys, welcome back to Black Magic Craft. Miniature foam hoses. Something that has made appearances in the background of many of my videos and is probably my most requested build. I've avoided doing build videos on mini houses for quite some time, for the three years that this channel has existed. I've done some smaller ones like the Hag's Hut, but a full building I have yet to do with good reason. These are complicated builds. They involve many, many different techniques in combination and trying to summarize them in a single tutorial video is a daunting task. I feel now with my 200 some videos that I've covered every aspect that's involved in building one of these well enough that I can finally now build one for you guys and try to do a tutorial video on it. There are tons of steps and techniques involved in building something like this. It's not complicated or really difficult, but there's a lot of information to share. I really didn't know how I was going to film it or sum it up because there's just so much going on. I debated doing a vlog style video, but I realized that it would turn into a very long video if I did that. So instead I filmed the whole process and I'm gonna attempt to voice over the steps, but honestly, I'm not gonna go into huge detail of every little step because that would still take too long. I'm just gonna share with you what I think is the most important information when doing a project like this and share my kind of thought process when I build something like this that's complicated and has a lot of steps. My original plan was to do this in a single video, but I realized that that's actually crazy. So today we're gonna get it to this point, which is the vast majority of the build, getting the structure and all of the details done with two exceptions. The stucco that's gonna go in on in between the timbers here, I'm gonna tackle that next week in its own video and the shingles because this is a time intensive task and there's a lot of different ways to approach it. So I'm gonna do that separately because I don't actually have a video on doing just shingles and I think it deserves its own. And then in the end, we're gonna paint this bad boy up. So for today, we're gonna get through the lion's share of the work and I haven't started editing that part of the video yet. That's what I'm gonna do immediately after filming this and I hope I can find a way to make it manageable and informative. Wish me luck, guys. Let's build a house. It's important to know that there are several ways you can go about creating a miniature building. In general, I take the approach of building a substructure and applying layers of material to create all the various elements. The substructure can be made from whatever you like really. Foam core, cardboard, XPS foam, all good options. You can make the substructure out of solid foam blocks or use thinner material to build a hollow shell. I've done both and I don't have a preference, nor do I have a preference for the material. Each time I build something like this, my decision for method depends on my mood. In this case, I felt like working with foam core and a blade. Next time, it might be a solid chunk of foam. The other and most important lesson I'd like to offer here is that of measurement and scale. I'm constantly asked about the size of my buildings. I wanna be very clear, it doesn't matter. When I create a substructure, I generally eyeball it. I will use a ruler to ensure I'm making pieces that are square and true, but that's where the measuring will end on this project. After those pieces, everything will be done with eyeball and by holding up pieces to mark them and cut them at the right lengths. If you get hung up on measurements with projects like this, you can cripple yourself with overthinking and inaction. Many people have asked me for templates to do buildings, and while that's something I would like to offer to the community, 
I've never done it because the reality is that templates are kind of ineffective for this type of work. So much of what is done when building these houses is based off the thickness of materials used. Templates quickly become useless when there's a variety of different materials involved. The template won't work for everyone in all of their materials. So grab what you have what you like to work with, and just start building. When doing something like the face of a building with a roof line, I do find it helpful to create a quick little template just to ensure I make the pieces symmetrical and can replicate them a few times for the project. But even those I don't actually measure, I just lay out something that looks right to me at that given moment. With this building, I decided early on that I didn't want it to have a playable interior or a roof that came off. I think that's kind of a fool's errand for tabletop RPG buildings, and I recommend you checking out my video on the subject. Making this a static building meant I could cut the time of the project almost in half without really sacrificing anything in terms of usability in games. These buildings are just too small to bother with the interiors. Because it would be static and I wanted the window on the second floor, I decided to cut that out before assembling. While measuring isn't important, it is important to try and think a few steps ahead so you don't build yourself into a corner. That's really the most important thing when approaching a project like this. For the window, I used some laser cut MDF windows that I got from shiftinglines.com. They're convenient, durable, and ready to use. For the door, I was able to reap what I had sewn previously and use one of the resin doors that I made in bulk in a previous video. Having details like this ready to go will really speed up the process of buildings and make the projects far less daunting. I wanted the door to be above ground level, so I created a little foam step for the front and applied individual bricks to create the building foundation. These bricks were cut in bulk on my Proxon and quickly textured with my rocks in a can technique that I have shown in a previous video. For the tops of the steps, I created larger stone slabs from foam that I textured with a hot wire engraver. This creates a really strong and sharp texture that really mimics stone and makes it stand out and different from the more rounded bricks I used on the foundation. A major element to making these Tudor style houses is the timbers. Once you're comfortable using a hot wire cutter and understand the grain of XPS foam, you can efficiently make big batches of planks and effectively add wood grain to them using a wire brush. There are likely some rules to how Tudor houses are constructed but I don't know them, nor do I really care to learn them. I don't even live somewhere that has them. I live in a country where a hundred year old building is considered ancient. Much like measurements, I think it's important to not get too caught up in the details of authenticity. Just do what you think looks cool. It doesn't hurt to check some reference photos for inspiration, but don't try to replicate them too perfectly. One of the trickier parts of this building was doing a frame around the arched door. Man, square doors are so much easier. I didn't quite like the idea of using bent timber and instead opted for a stone frame. This, again, might not be historically accurate on a Tudor house, but then again, I, I don't care. It will look cool. Doing stone arches can be quite challenging. I always struggle with the angles of the stone, but one cool method I've developed is to let the corners of the stone pieces run wild and then go in with the hot wire engraver and carefully shape the perimeter of the arch. This requires some care, but the results are really, really good. This method works great. The building process continues with more application of wood strips. When doing curved bits along the roof line, hot glue is an absolute lifesaver. The second day of this build was started with an important decision, the overhang. I had made the second floor intentionally larger than the first to give some visual interest and to allow me to add details like support beams later. But up until this point, I didn't know how I would orient that overhang. In the end, I decided to flush up the walls on two sides and create an offset overhang that I thought looked the most interesting.
Now for those support beams. These are one of the details that really make the piece. The Proxon and a wire brush make quick work of creating these timbers. Again, everything is cut to length without measuring and instead just by holding it up and eyeballing the length. When doing these types of details, it's crucial that you remember to add some wood grain to the end cut of the exposed foam. Before closing up the roof, I added a little bit of parchment paper behind the window. This would act as a light diffuser should I want to add LEDs to the build later. And once the roof was on, I'd lose access to this window, so I did it now. You could also use something like clear plastic, which would probably look better with the lights off, but possibly worse with the lights on. Parchment paper was just something that I had on hand, so that's what I went with. For the substructure of the roof, I used cereal box cardstock. The medium weight chipboard that I often use in other projects is just far too thick and rigid to form to the curve of a roof like this. And something like construction paper is too thin. Cereal box material is ideal. So get to the recycling bin and grab some and you're good to go. Don't forget to hide the underside of that type of overhang with more foam timber. A chimney adds a bit of realism to the house, but more so it's important for adding another layer of material and variation to the overall form. You can do this out of solid foam that you carve to look like bricks, but I really prefer the looks of individual bricks despite the extra work. I opted to create a substructure again to glue individual bricks to. I didn't measure this, but I did use my bricks to create a shape and size that worked well with that size brick and brick pattern. So I guess technically I did measure it. I just used bricks as the measuring tool. I cut away some material in the house to allow the chimney form to be directly attached. Another important lesson here, don't be afraid to hack away at your piece and cut off some of the stuff you've just put on it in order to make something fit. That's one of the great benefits of working with foam. You can do that. When going over parts like the angle of the chimney, I always let my bricks run wild, then cut them off after the glue has cured. This is the easiest and most effective way to get these shapes. For the cap of the chimney, I made good use of some of the numerous super glue caps that I had been saving for just such an occasion. Part of the process of these buildings is adding more and more layers and details until you're happy with it. The more details, the better the piece will look. But it's also important to keep things in mind like painting and put details in places that make sense and will help you later when painting and not make your life more difficult. To get the building to this stage, it took me two crafting sessions. Nothing I've done here is particularly difficult or complicated or even very precise. It's all just an exercise in creativity, patience, and improvisation. If you take the time to do neat work and think a few steps ahead, it will give you a much better result more quickly than if you spend all your time worrying about templates, measurements, and scale. If it's not clear yet, my biggest message here is put away your ruler, forget about scale, and just start building. It's only foam. Finally, I built a complicated house on the channel. I hope you found this video enjoyable and informative. If you did, hit that like button and let me know in the comment section below. Doing so really helps this channel grow on the platform. If you want to pick up any tools or supplies to build your own house or whatever other terrain you want, head over to blackmagiccraft.ca. There I have my essential equipment store with links to all of the tools and stuff that I use and recommend. There are affiliate links, so if you buy through those or buy anything else after clicking them, 
I get a small commission and that helps fund videos like this one. Another way you can really help me continue to make these videos is by supporting Black Magic Craft on Patreon. These videos are a lot of work. Some of them take over 40 hours to complete and I do them every week in addition to a secondary review video. So it's a lot of work, takes a lot of time. And the reason I can dedicate that time to them is because of Patreon. So if you really, really value these videos that I make, they help you a lot, consider reciprocating and joining Black Magic Craft on Patreon. I'd love to have you as the newest member of the Black Magic Craft Fellowship. That's it for this week, guys. I'll see you again on Tuesday for the review video, but then I'll see you on Friday when we apply the stucco texture to this thing. Cheers.